welcome Riverside Baptist Church. We're glad you are here to worship the Lord with us, that perfect one who makes us strong and whole and complete when we couldn't be on our own. I want to ask you if you would join me in the bulletins. Look at a couple of quick announcements. Uh, after service today at 3, it'll be youth meeting. And then the uh, rest of this week, uh, Tuesday, is deacons meeting, but no women's Bible study. Deacons meet at 7. Uh, Wednesday and Thursday, normal prayer meeting and men's Bible study. Next Sunday, the youth will also meet. Remember, they're meeting every Sunday this month to uh, do their vacation Bible school. And we will also be going to, not the youth, but the rest of us will be going to uh, Brookdale. Be, please be there by 315. And our circle of friends meets next Sunday as well. So a lot of stuff happening, but uh, not overlapping, I don't think, in any place with the sense of time. So uh, make that on your calendars. I've got a uh, announcement, not an announcement, I got a card here from uh, the Newberg family. Uh, and they want to thank the church for the beautiful floral arrangement in honor of our beloved mother and grandmother, Miss Francis Newberg. So I'll put this on the bulletin board in the fellowship hall if you'd like to see it. But it's a thank you from uh, Jamie and his family for, uh, on behalf of Miss Francis for her funeral. Okay. Another announcement for the men. Men folk, we have an opportunity to go to a Bible conference at uh, a local one at uh, Fellowship Baptist Church in Moyot, that's James Hannington's church. Uh, he won't be one of the speakers, but he will be hosting. Uh, we have several speakers there. Uh, former pastor of Rocky Hawk, uh, I'm sorry, of Eaglewood Baptist in Rocky Hawk, Dr. Kohler, Clover, uh, Dr. Cook, who is with the uh, uh, Baptist State Convention in North Carolina, and Dr. Thomas, who's uh, on the uh, man, North American Condition Board. So we got some pretty good speakers. They're uh, good preachers, and uh, we have a chance to hear them. That is Saturday, September 15th. The whole conference goes from 9 to 3. Lunch is provided, and uh, it's all covered under the $20 cost. So, fellas, think about, pray about if you can go. I think we'll have a good time of fellowship and just worshiping with other men, and uh, it will be good for us. There's also going to be worship and music and things like that. So let me know if you want to go, and I'll get us registered. Any other announcements? Oh, uh, make sure you tell Faye if your phone number or address has changed because she's getting ready to print the new directory uh, for the new church here. Any other announcements? Okay. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Holy God, we thank you for this day you have given us. Thank you, Lord, for the, the cooler weather we've had this week. I thank you, Lord, that you have brought us back here to worship you in this place. Uh, I know several of our church family are gone or, or traveling or not able to be here. I ask that you bless them and protect them. Bring them back to us. And I pray, Holy God, that you would be here with us this morning. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, free from distractions, free from temptation. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to focus on you. And let this time of, of centering ourselves and our lives around you spill over to the whole week that's about to start. And I pray, Lord, that this worship would saturate the coming week. That you, we would be so full of our praises for you and how wonderful you are, thankfulness and joy of our salvation, that the temptations of the world, the, the struggles, the hardships that may happen this week, won't be able to get us down, won't be able to take away from us that joy, that peace, that love that you provide. We ask you these things, Lord, because I don't think we could handle the world without you. I don't think we could handle this, this regular life without you. And so, Lord, we confess that we need you. We definitely need you as our Savior. We thank you. We love you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, first hymn this morning is Oh, How I Love Jesus, hymn number 217. Let's sing the first, second, and last verses of 217.
Right. Where I didn't expect half of my audience to run down the hallway, but uh, sometimes when things call, you got to answer the call before uh, other things can happen. So we'll go ahead and have children's sermon, just me and Leo. Come on, God damn it. All right, and maybe I, uh, Nathan will get back and join us in a minute. Wait, what is this? It's a toothbrush, right? You got a toothbrush, and you got some toothpaste, right? You brush your teeth, right? Every day? Okay. Check. All right. Okay, so we got a toothbrush, we got some toothpaste, right? Are you going to brush your teeth? No, no, not quite. But you know what we do? We put the toothbrush, toothpaste on the toothbrush, right? And then we put it under the water, put it in the mouth. All right. Well, what I want you to try to do today, if you can, is get that toothpaste back inside the toothpaste tube. Do you want to try it? Go for it. One second, I got some napkins here. Got some napkins here. All right. You got a lot of it back in there. Yep. Okay. You did better than I thought you would do. That's a good job. Now, it's kind of messy around the top, isn't it? Right there. And there's still some here on the brush, right? I don't know if you have to see that, some sort of pressure. Okay. Okay, so we got some mess around the tube and some still on the top. You can't get it all off. And it isn't all the way back inside the tube. It's poking out on top. Right? Okay, I'm going to wipe that so it'll make more of a mess. Get the cat back on. So what in the world is the preacher doing I'm talking about toothpaste on Sunday morning? Well, when we use our words in ways that hurt people, it's kind of like that toothpaste. Because when words that we say hurt other folks, it's really hard to take it back. Now, we can say, and we should say, I'm sorry, and we should apologize, but that doesn't remove all the toothpaste. Does it? It like you can't get all the toothpaste off. And it still leaves a little bit of mess, doesn't it? Just like that. We can't get all of our words back and we can't clean up all of the mess that it leaves if we say things that hurt people. Like if we say something mean about them or if we uh, you know, tell somebody something that's not true about them or make fun of them. Those things can hurt people and that stays with them for a long, long time. Just like that toothpaste is going to stay on that toothbrush. Because even if you say you're sorry, you can't get it all back. It's still, the hurt is still there with them. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, let no corrupt talk proceed out of your mouth. That is, don't let anything that's foul or what we shouldn't say come out of our mouth. But only that which is good to the use of edifying, that's building up and encouraging. So only that things that come out of your mouth only that things come out of your mouth that are building up and encouraging <coughs> other people. Right? Yeah. So that's what the Bible says. And I hope you remember that before you talk, think about what you want to say if it want to make that person better off or worse off. Because um, you can't you always take that. Do you always have to say something that makes other people like always have to encourage someone? Like it's not that everything we say has to be something that's encouraging, but we shouldn't ever say something that's not good. Like we can talk about normal things, like you talk about your shows or your games or what you like to play, things like that. But we shouldn't let mean things or insulting things come out of our mouth that would hurt the people. All right, well, that's what I got today. Miss Amanda has children's uh, church for you. So going back, and I think you're studying about Paul today, his travels. Yes, if you would, please. Yes. I'm really surprised he didn't try to tell everybody he lost a tooth last night. And uh, the tooth fairy has also gone through inflation. I used to get quarters. He got a couple of dollars, 10 times the amount. Inflation's a horrible thing. <laughs> All right. Uh, now is the time where we come to uh, ask the Lord's blessing on other for other people. Uh, we have, uh, you see the prayer concern list there. Uh, chat is back home. 
um, from his procedure and his surgery, and Jenny said he is doing pretty well. <coughs> he is uh, getting used to his new routine, and um, so she's thankful, asking that you continue to pray for his recovery and rehab. Um, Emily and Mac, I heard, and if you got their newsletter, you saw that in the email too. They're getting ready uh, for their new assignment in Boone, and uh, they're settling in to their new place, making it their own, and uh, they're looking forward to getting started at uh, the college. Any other updates? Some unspoken? Any other? Prayer concerns, praise reports. Okay. Let's lift these up to the Lord. Holy Father God, we come before you again this morning thanking you for the opportunity to be in your presence through the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the chance to bring to you our concerns. We thank you that you care about us uh, individually and as as groups, as a body of believers, as nations. You care um, about what we do, how we do it. You are concerned for all your creation. And so, Lord, we, we thank you that you love us so well and you care so much for us. We ask you, Lord, to be with those we know who are, who are sick, who are uh, recovering, who are struggling with cancer, who are waiting for appointments, Lord, we know that so many have ongoing issues and needs of the body. Uh, we know some who are just shut in because of their body and the, just the place they are in their life right now. And so, we, Lord, we ask for them that you give them patience and perseverance. Uh, we give them joy in where they are. The joy that comes from you, not in circumstance. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, provide for their families and those people who are taking care of them. Give them strength also. We pray that you be with the ones we know who are serving and the missionaries we don't know around the world and here in the U.S. who are spreading your gospel, who are planting churches, who are training new church leaders. We ask you, Lord, to bless their efforts and guide them. Give them peace and strength. Give them the resources they need. And, Lord, we just pray that you open the doors for the ministry where you would have it and close the doors where you would like keep it from being. Lord, we ask you, that the holder of the keys of death itself, that you would make the way. Help us to walk in your way so that we are doing your work in and through our lives. We ask you these things so that your will be done, not ours. In the name of Jesus, amen. And our offertory hand this morning is hymn number 415. Let's sing all three verses of 415.
Last week, I think I joked at the end of the sermon or the service after the invitation that today we want to talk about murder. Pretty simple on the surface. Don't do it. Don't kill somebody. But then as soon as you say that, questions start arising, right? Like, well, what if it's in self-defense? Or what if it's accident? What if it's in warfare? What if it's this and what if it's that? And calm down, the Bible explains. It gives a lot of examples. But I want to get to first principles first here, and uh, that's in Genesis 9. Back in Genesis 9. This is right after Noah uh, and the, the ark story. They had come out of the ark. Uh, Rainbow has appeared for the first time. And God is telling Noah about how they can they can eat the meat of the animals that are still there. Of course, don't hunt them to extinction is the implied thing. There's only seven of the uh, clean ones and a pair of the unclean ones and that sort of thing. But in chapter 9, he gives them uh, this warning that has been from the beginning. Chapter 9, verse 4. The flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. At the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. One of the primary virtues that uh, many people around the world share, but is definitely a Christian virtue, is the sanctity of life. All human life is sacred. It is made in the image of God. This is from Genesis chapter 2, when God said, let us make man in our image talking to the Father, talking with the Son and the Spirit. And they made man in God's image. And so that connection we have with God makes our lives different than an animal life or a plant life. And it is something sacred. It is something that God will exact judgment and uh, it's justice. So it's not really vengeance, but it is in a sense a vengeance of justice that if someone kills someone else, their life is also forfeit. Capital punishment is in the scripture. This is, of course, one of the Ten Commandments. The people of God are not to take the lives of other people lightly. We are to consider the life and livelihood of others. And we should definitely not do violence that ends a life. Thou shalt not murder. Now, addressing the questions that I figuratively gave y'all, what about self-defense? What about warfare? Well, we see this as the law code expands in Exodus 21, 22, Numbers 35. I'll give you some passages there in the outline on the back of the bulletin. But when the Bible says in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder, this is what we would call first degree murder. The law code goes on to explain that if you kill somebody purposefully, this is premeditated plan, you're going to get your vengeance on them, much like Cain did Abel, then your life is forfeited. You are going to be killed by the executioner, the uh, avenger of blood is what the Old Testament calls them. This is a close relative. Uh, that's why God said here, oh, I'm going to require it by the hand of man, man's brother. So the person who died, his close relative, would be the executioner for the murderer. If it is premeditated. But there are many sections in the Old Testament law and in Joshua, how they set up what God calls cities of refuge. And the way this would work is if somebody died, the would-be killer can flee to the city of refuge and the executioner can't execute them in the city. They go there, they're safe until the trial. And then the trial, where you have to have at least two or three witnesses, determines if this was premeditated or an accident. And if it is accidental, the life is not required of the man who accidentally killed his brother, his fellow Israelite. 
but he has to stay in the city of refuge. He stays there until the high priest dies. If it is premeditated murder, even in the city of refuge, that man is taken out and he is given the capital punishment by the executioner because he's found guilty of murdering one of God's people. So accidents do not get the death penalty. Self, uh, not self, uh, excuse me, premeditated, first degree murder, death penalty. Do not kill somebody on purpose. What about warfare, you may ask? God commands warfare. Just war, holy war that God commanded his people against uh, the people of Canaan, against uh, their other foes, the Edomites sometimes. Uh, these warfare aspects have their own rules, but that is not murder. Soldier killing a soldier is not murder. They're doing so in warfare. Now, we see in the, the case of King David, his life story, one of their generals kills another one out of revenge, not in the battlefield, but waits for him in the city while he was coming under the, a treaty to speak with the king and negotiate. But uh, General Joab kills him out of revenge because that other man killed one of his family. That was murder. That was wrong. That wasn't in battle. Self-defense is not murder. Uh, look at Exodus 22, 2 through 3 if you want to. If someone breaks into your house at night and you fight back and you kill them, you are not guilty. Interestingly, if he breaks in during the daytime and you can see what you're doing, you're not supposed to kill him, but you can still defend yourself. Old Testament law. I didn't like it. Yeah. Um, preacher in a show I like he was after they were trying to rescue their captain from some bad guys who had killed him. And the preacher gets the call and is like, I'm going to help too. First officer says, doesn't the Bible have some particular things to say about murder preacher? Sure does. It's a bit fuzzy on the subject of kneecaps. You can defend yourself. Try not to take life, you can help. But a self- Righteous, a self-advancing, uh, plotting, malicious, premeditated murder is an evil to the Lord. Uh, in number 35, it says, bloodshed like that pollutes the whole land. And this goes back to Cain and Abel. Remember when Cain killed Abel? God said to Cain, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. That soaked it up. It makes the land and the nation worse. It pollutes it. It corrupts it. And especially if this is left unpunished, then life is cheap. People can be violent to each other, hurt each other, and kill one another as they want to, and that is not just. That is not something in God's kingdom. The law goes on and tells us that neglect can bring guilt. It's not just active, premeditated murder, but um, the Bible's examples, Exodus 21, 29. If you have a bull that you know is dangerous, you know is violent and has attacked people before, and you don't do enough to protect people from it, you don't keep it contained, you don't keep it uh, safe, we'll go ahead and kill it, and it kills somebody, then the bull needs to be killed, and the owner should be killed, because they allow this violent danger that they knew about. They knew from prior experience this thing was dangerous. They didn't do enough to keep people safe. If you build a house and you have an open space on your roof, and a lot of the Old Testament and first century AD houses had flat roofs where people could, could meet, could sit, the room was the roof was one of the rooms. But you don't put a little wall around it to keep people from falling and someone falls off your roof, you had guilt for not protecting them and not making it safe. If you left a big pit or well uncovered and something or someone fell in, you had to replace that animal or you had blood guilt for the loss of life because you did not keep it safe. The law of the Old Testament, through that law, God is telling us that he wants us to be at least basically considerate of other people's safety. It's not an extreme need. Keep your dangerous animals pinned in and safe. 
keep you well covered so Timmy can't fall down the well. Massey has to come find us. Put a railing or a fence or something around the open areas that are not protected so they can't fall off if they're up there. Now our roofs, there shouldn't be anybody walking around in our slanted roofs. It's a very different kind of structure. But the principle is that we should consider others and their lives valuable. Jesus, of course, uh, like he did with the commandment not to commit adultery, he expands on this and takes it to a heart issue. In Matthew 5, 21-22, this is part of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, talking about Moses, Thou shalt not kill. And whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, that is a, a term of open disdain and condescension, shall be in danger of the council. And whoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Like he did with adultery, what's the core of adultery is lusting after somebody so you commit adultery in your heart. If you're angry at somebody, if you're wrathful towards somebody, and if you start thinking those kinds of murderous thoughts, you are guilty. Now, I don't think there's a, an equality here that if you have a mean thought and think about, fantasize about killing somebody, then you should be killed. I don't think that's eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but the basic of the Old Testament law. But there is guilt. You are in danger of judgment. You are in danger of being brought to the council or being brought before God's judgment. Uh, thou fool, literally to Jesus' audience, would be calling somebody a, a grossly immoral, worthless person. To us, fool just means somebody who's, who's stupid, who is uh, maybe weak-minded, or is, you know, uh, mentally really slow. To them, that had a connotation, the word fool did, of a moral bankruptcy. Think about Proverbs. And Proverbs talks about the fool versus the wise person, a person who seeks wisdom. The fool is this immoral person who was never going to learn, who's never going to do what's right. It is a corrupt, fully corrupt person. So bringing our judgment onto people, openly holding other folks in disdain and thinking so little of them and we share this opinion with everybody in the world who listen. That's raka, that's what that means. Being angry at them without cause. Now this doesn't mean that, hey, you know, he, he stepped on my foot, he said something um, without thinking, that made me mad, so I'm okay being mad at him, and I'm okay thinking about how much I like to punch him in the face. That's not what he means by without reason. But we do see God and Jesus themselves get angry. Jesus got angry with uh, Pharisees. He got angry with the, uh, the business people in the temple that were interrupting worship and keeping the Gentiles from getting to the place where they were allowed to worship by all their selling and their animals and all the noise they were making. He drove them out of the temple in anger. When Lazarus died, he wept, but he also said he got angry. Now, he doesn't say exactly at who or what. He might have been angry with Mary and Martha for their lack of faith. Maybe. I don't think so. I think he's angry at the death. I think he's angry that we have to go through this. I think maybe he's angry at the other people who are like, well, if he had been here, I guess he didn't care enough. And that makes you kind of angry when someone says you don't care enough about your best friend. Lazarus was a good friend. But he was angry at something there. And we know he didn't sin, so it was justifiable anger. So I think that's the difference he's drawing here without cause. The justifiable, they're insulting God, they are making it hard for the people to worship, they are doing something really horrible to the name and reputation of God or the hindering someone from worshiping and coming to God. Those are all examples of things we should be justifiably angry at. 
But if you're just angry because you don't like him, because he smells bad, because he said something flippantly that you take offense at, or if um, he's just a weird guy and you don't like him because he acts funny. That's not okay. The Bible is saying that's not okay. And like God said to Cain, you're angry at your brother. And you gotta look out. Because sin is waiting, crouching, ready to devour you. God creates this image here when he's talking to Cain that sin is ready to pounce on you like a wild animal about to tear you apart and devour you. But if you do right, you will be accepted, he tells Cain. Now we know the story. Cain didn't do right. Cain let this anger fester and he attacked his brother. And then God cast him out of the area he and his wife had to leave. So as he does with many of the laws, Jesus tells us that this becomes a heart matter. We have to watch our hearts. We have to watch our attitudes towards other people. We have to watch how we think. And even sometimes what we do. How we build. How we handle our animals. How we allow situations to progress. If we know there could be danger, we should do something to stop it. These are the principles that the Old and New Testament give us. And I think John sums it up nicely, and I gave it to you there in the last bullet point on this part of the sermon. If anyone, I'm sorry, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in them. Now, this doesn't mean it's okay to hate people who aren't Christians, just like it wasn't okay to hate people who weren't Israelites in the Old Testament. But it's especially wrong to God, especially hurtful to God, for us to hate one another. Because he has poured out so much love on us. Because he has forgiven so much from us that we should be willing to forgive so much from others. And this is a principle Jesus repeats over and over and over. As you have been forgiven, so you should forgive. He also says the, the other way around. Like you forgive others, that's the way God's going to forgive you. Sometimes that's a worrisome thought. We need to start letting anger fester in our minds and in our hearts. Because God doesn't do that. God is quick to forgive and slow to anger. And so many times people are the opposite. And that's something we need to pray about, seek God about, and try to shape ourselves more and more like Christ to be quick to forgive and slow to anger. Since we have an ordination service here in a few minutes, this is the end of the sermon. It's going to be simple. Don't do it. We're about to sing our hymn of invitation. And the invitation is, of course... Do you need to come and pray about somebody that you're angry with? Do you need to come and pray about someone who's angry with you? And then make a plan with God about how you can go and restore that relationship with the person. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, after Jesus said this, he talks about if there's someone angry at you, leave your gift at the altar, go and reconcile with them, and then come back and worship. So if you want to come and pray, if you want to come and pray about that person you need to forgive and ask help doing it, God will help you. If you want to come and pray about someone who needs to forgive you, ask God to help you to repent to them, to open their heart and soften their heart, to accept your sincere apology and repentance. Maybe you need to come and get forgiveness from God for something else entirely. Maybe you've never asked God to forgive you of your sins in the first place. And you want to live in that forgiveness he offers freely. Whatever God's putting on your heart, please come. And after that, I don't think we've got to hurry because we've got some else planned. This is the most important thing that could happen. But after that's done, then we'll go to the ordination service. <laughs>
you get two for the price of one today. If you want to join me in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 tells the story of the men who are called the first deacons uh, by us. The Bible doesn't actually use the word deacon uh, or servant there, but these seven men are widely considered to be the first deacons. And I want to read and speak about that office for just a moment. This is, of course, early in the church. Peter has given his sermon, 3,000 plus came to the salvation that day. More and more Christians were being added every day. And it says, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. All of these were Jews. Jews from outside of the Judea area. Those were Greek-speaking Jews and the Hebrew-speaking Jews. Because the Grecian widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Perminus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And this is the first laying on of hands service in the church. It was the first call of any kind of official capacity for a job other than the apostles' leadership. And you may be tempted to say, well, the apostles are kind of shirking their duty. And can you imagine coming to me or any other pastor and saying, well, preacher, there's this great uh, problem. Uh, our charity is not being handled fairly. The money we had designated wasn't given out rightly to other people or whatever we had taken up to collect and give to others. So you need to do something about it. And one of the preachers said, now I'm too busy, you pick out seven guys and let them take care of it. That wouldn't go over too well, right? The preacher's trying to show them his duty there. This is a major problem. But let's remember the situation. There was no Bible. There were no letters from Paul or anybody that made up the New Testament. There was nothing in writing anywhere that explained who Jesus was or what he did. The only source of teaching about Jesus were from the eyewitnesses. And so these guys were like, we're the only source of any kind of truth about Jesus, and we've got to be focusing on getting that salvation message. Find other people who are wise, who are just and honest, full of the Holy Spirit, and they can take care of this while we do the thing that only we can do. So they weren't trying to shirk a duty. They were saying, we need some help getting everything done that needs to be done. And that's what the deacons are. They are servants to the whole church. That's what the word deacon means. It means a servant to the whole church. They work with the apostles to do what the church needed to do. And they are not just people who handed out the offering and divvied up the food that was collected. Uh, we see Stephen and Philip, the only two that get stories in the book of Acts, but they are sharing the gospel. They're working miracles. They are telling people about Jesus and leading them to Christ. Stephen is the first martyr. Not an apostle, but a deacon. They are told, basically, as Peter put it here, to wait on tables. And, and I love that. I don't think Peter is putting it down. I think Peter's like, we can't do that job and this job. But in our culture, waiting on tables is kind of a low position, right? Now, I couldn't do it. I couldn't be a waiter. I would forget who got what. I would spill things that I'm clumsy. Everybody would be covered in tea. It would be a mess. 
But I think part of what it's saying is there's no job that should look like this is beneath us to a servant of Christ. And you know what that makes me think of? That makes me think of Mr. Vance. Because when I first got here, and for a long time thereafter, I was really impressed because every Monday, Vince Sawyer came in and got the trash. He's one of the oldest men in the church, one of the most respected men in the church, often the chairman of deacons, and all the deacon board if he wasn't chairman, and here he is picking up the garbage. It's a man who would serve. It doesn't matter what it took. What needed to be doing, he would help do. That's the mindset of a deacon. What needs to be done? How can I help my church? How can I help the people in my church? Remember, church are the people. How can I serve them? That's what the seven were asked. Rick, that's what you're being asked to do by the church. They were problem solvers. Something unfair was happening. Some ladies were being not given enough food others were getting more. It's not equal. It's not fair and even. And so we need somebody to look into it to be in charge of it. And so they came in and they fixed the problem. They made sure it was done rightly. Something else a deacon does. They're problem solvers. They help mediate conflict and resolve it peacefully. They are people who use the church's resources with the church's permission to serve others and minister to folks. The first deacons were handing out the food that was collected. Remember, 3,000 people of the folks who came in for Pentecost got saved. Many of those Jews did not live there. They came for the holy day of Pentecost to celebrate. They didn't want to go back home. But now they're Christians. And the only way to learn more about Jesus is to hear it from Peter and James and John and the other 12 who were his eyewitnesses. So they had to stay. They didn't have jobs. They didn't have homes and places to stay in locally. They didn't have any way of feeding and taking care of themselves. So the ones who were local took up food. The church was giving it out. These disciples made sure the church's resources were used fairly for God's work among God's people. Now, we also include that sometimes with people outside the church, as it should be. This is what deacons do. So in a minute, the man, the man you chose, congregation, as they chose their seven, you're chosen great. You chose the others, but they've already gone through something like this. Our current deacons are going to lay hands on him and pray over him following this model. But first, if you want to read along, these are in the back page of your bulletin um, underneath the outline deacon ordination. I want to give a charge to Rick as the new deacon, but I also have a charge to the church. And I know you guys don't normally talk back. You're not an amen crowd, but... I do want, if you would commit to this, to give a verbal yes or I will. Do you, Riverside Baptist Church, commit yourselves to pray for Rick and your other deacons? Do you, Riverside Baptist Church, commit yourselves to communicate well with Rick and your other deacons and your pastor? Any needs, suggestions, or concerns you may have? We can't do something if we don't know about it. Do you commit yourselves to encourage what is done well and to keep criticism or those suggestions and concerns constructive, loving, patient, kind, and kingdom focused? Yes. Two and three are important that they go together. We have to know what needs to be done. We have to know what ideas you have. Because we may not come up with all the good ideas ourselves. We won't. You guys want to have good ideas too. But those suggestions, those concerns, those needs, they need to be gentle, they need to be loving. As the Bible says, speak truth in love. 
And as I said to little kids, only what's good for building up the whole. Rick, would you and Linda make your way forward? I don't know how long-winded praying some of these guys might be, so why don't you sit down? Rick, do you commit yourself to serving your Lord and your church in the capacity as deacon with humility to the best of your ability? Do you commit yourself to working with the other leaders in your church to advance the kingdom of God as the Holy Spirit empowers and enables you? I would like to ask our current serving deacons if you would come up, make your way behind, place your hands on Rick's shoulders, just your palms, not your fists. William said earlier, I might be in them, right? Not yet, there's nothing wrong. It's not being straight. But place your hands on them. And say a prayer, sincere prayer for him, for his ministry, uh, as a deacon of the church, if all of our current deacons would. Just come behind, exit up that way. We will lay hands on them. Holy God, I ask that you be with Rick and Linda Jim. As they enter into this kind of ministry that's new to Rick, I pray, Lord, that you would give him guidance. Give him wisdom of your Holy Spirit. Lord, he has been entrusted by this congregation to be a servant leader. And I pray, Lord, that you would help him to do all of what that means. Help us, Lord, to work well together with each other as deacons and pastor, and as well with each other in the congregation. And we may be one in doing your kingdom's work and advancing your purpose. I pray, Lord, for Linda. I know she's going to be a great support to him as she has been all of their relationship and their lives together. And I pray you help her to continue to encourage, to strengthen, to hold accountable, and to do all the things a great partner must do. And I pray, Lord, these things that your will be done in and through Rick and Linda Joe and through us as leadership at Riverside. In the name of Jesus. Now, I don't want anybody to think or say, Rick, that I ordained you, Riverside Baptist Church. 
and I've ordained you as a deacon. This will be my pleasure as their pastor to officiate this and to give you the certificate that says as much. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have anything you want to say or pray over them? So, Brother Rick, will you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, 